Hey, thanks yeah. first of all to the to Rick and Judy and the Northern Arizona Realtors Association for inviting me today. Um, I just want to know really quickly in the chat um, what made you interested in today's conversation about the Southside Community Association. So if you wouldn't mind, just take a few minutes and um, in the webinar chat, which I think you can pull up, go ahead and just write down why you thought, what you're hoping to get out of the conversation today and what we can provide in the presentation. I'll try and, and get out a few of those things as we, as we go along. Um, so the Southside Community Plan is the third area plan that the city has adopted since 2014. Um, see if my slides will advance. Specific plans are what legally um, we call a neighborhood plan like La Plaza Vieja or Southside plan. And also plans that discuss kind of in detail a topic across the whole city like the high occupancy housing plan. Now, not everything the city calls a plan is actually a specific plan. Specific plans are very um, unique in that they must show conformance with our city's general plan, which here is called the Flagstaff Regional Plan. Um, and it applies to both the city of Flagstaff and to the surrounding area. So it covers Belmont, Dony Park, Kachina, the Kachina Village area, and all of those parts just around the city that are part of the metropolitan planning area for Flagstaff. Um, those pieces are very important because that means that these documents have the same regulatory purpose as the regional plan. So when somebody comes in and applies for a rezoning case, it says the uh, purpose of it is to be in conformance with the regional plan and all applicable specific plans. So I know a lot of realtors um, and folks in development in Flagstaff will pull up the regional plan, but then later they will find out um, that, oh, there was also an area plan. And th there are a few area plans besides these three that we've recently adopted. They're a little older, like McMillan Mesa Village, Woodlands Village area, um, and there's also a downtown strategic plan. So all of those plans set up the framework under which we consider um, how the zoning code, the capital improvement planning, housing plans, and engineering standards, and even some of the budget process is considered in the city. So these are important ways of kind of taking a lens that's a little finer than a citywide lens, which is what we look at at the regional plan, and then um, looking at it for just a neighborhood or just an area or just a specific topic. So specific plans can be that roadmap. They can refine what we call the area and place types for the city. And I'll show you a little more about what those are when we get into the presentation. Um, they can influence these rezoning requests. They can help define how the zoning code should be updated. Um, they also just provide some great illustrations that show what the vision is for the community, especially in volume two of this particular specific plan. Usually specific plans are one document, but there was so much rich learning that went on with the South Side that we created too. Um, and then also our partners can use these plans to apply for grants. So for instance, um, the La Plaza Vieja neighborhood, their plan was adopted in 2015, and they have been applying for grants to um, have some of the things that we put in the plan funded, not just by the general fund for the city um, or capital improvement budgeting, but also by some national endowments um, and foundations throughout the, city, throughout the community. So it's a way of really bringing all of those resources together. What a specific plan cannot do is it cannot change the existing entitlements. So we adopted the specific plan and it became effective October 1st. Um, however, everybody's zoning in the South Side is the exact same as it was September 29th. What happens now is that the zoning code manager and the city start moving forward with zoning code changes. Um, we have some to do left in La Plaza Vieja. We also have some to do in the South Side. Um, but we also can bring our city resources um, to these projects. So for instance, La Plaza Vieja had a bunch of improvements to Clay Avenue that were in the plan we adopted in 2015. This year is the year it's got on the capital improvement budget. We were actually able to also fund it with CDBG money and that project is now moving forward. So some of these projects get done right away and some of them take a little more time. 
Um, we also, in the fact that we've drawn il illustrations about some private properties, those are not compelling either. They're just a suggestion. They give you an idea of what could be appropriate and what could receive community support. That's one way I really talk about the illustrations in a specific plan is I say, if you wanna know what it looks like to build something that could get the support of this community, here's an idea. And that's a great conversation starter. People don't come in um, with ideas that are going to be um, mistrusted from the beginning. It can help people move through the process more effectively. So here's something we're really proud of with the Southside Community Plan. Um, the public engagement on this plan took us over three years to complete. Um, and we were very honored to receive a national award um, for the public engagement in this plan. We won the general project category for the International Association for Public, Participata public Participation's USA chapter. We are also named Project of the Year, which means that the Southside Community Plan is going to be um, sent to an international jury and reviewed with 43 other nations projects as a potential winner for the international award. So we're very, very pleased. Um, I think you recognize probably a few faces in these photos. Um, Rick Lopez, who's very involved in NARA, um, was on our stakeholder group, um, which helped us with our policy making and preparing the draft plan. Um, but really our goal was to have a really robust conversation, not just about the present and the future of the South Side, but the past and how that's influencing um, the people who are there today. Um, we went through this process when I laid it out the first time we thought, we'll talk about the vision, we'll talk about needs and solutions, we'll, we'll do some policy making, and then we're going to get a plan adopted. It was a much less linear process than that. It actually meant that we went through the process of talking about a vision and then needs back and forth a couple of times. Um, which was really part of the importance of listening and evaluating whether we were being successful, not based on whether we checked a box, but whether or not the conversation really brought out all the issues, was robust and included everyone um, that needed to be a part of it. So you probably as locals to Flagstaff are, are familiar with some of the, the, man, the pressures that the South Side's experiencing with student housing demand. Um, another piece of it that's really important is um, that the floodplain issues in the South Side, of course, are not a natural occurrence. Um, human beings who lived in Flagstaff in the early 20th century, century purposely moved the channel into this neighborhood um, for the purpose of protecting um, the lumber mills. However, that's left many of these homes, homeowners who maybe are second and third generation homeowners, unable to fully realize the equity of their property. Um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer projects, of course, is underway um, in the final stages of planning and may even be breaking ground very soon. Um, and that will be an opportunity to remap the floodplain for the south side. What we knew going into this was that whether or not uh, a Corps of Engineers project is completed, there were needs in the south side that had been going on unmet for many, many years in terms of preventing the flooding that's been experienced annually, helping homeowners um, take advantage of the properties that they have and realizing those values. We'll talk a lot more about what the plan does to help in that area as we go. Um, there's also been a lot, there's a lot of missing infrastructure in the South side. When you think about the South side, it's really the center of town. And yet there are many streets without curb gutter and sidewalk because of the floodplain issues, but also other, other reasons. Um, there was a time where there was some funding to improve sidewalks near Agassiz and Verde that money was redistributed to a project in the Pinal Brandon area, and there's never been money to come back and finish the intended work in this neighborhood. So there's times where the city has been moving money around, considering resources citywide, and the South Side hasn't always been high on the list. Um, we heard that story over and over again from the residents who were there. Um, and so we really had to be conscientious of that throughout the planning process. Oh, my side stopped advancing. Oh, there it is. Here's some examples of what on the bottom two pictures of what flooding looks like in the south side and also some conversations we had in the middle of the monsoon season, always very carefully planned so that we weren't getting actually rained on if it could help it. Um, but for the purpose of really talking about the impact of flooding and what it means, one of the things we found out people did not know about flooding in the south side was that because this is now a national register historic district, 
properties that are listed as eligible and are inventoried as part of the historic district no longer have a cap on this amount of money they can reinvest into their property. This is called the 10% substantial improvement rule. Many residents in the South Side did not know that there had been a National Register District in the South Side for the last nine years now, and they didn't know that they could invest more than 10% back in their property. But if you, even regardless of other rules, if it's on the National Register and you go through the process of getting your improvements approved by the Heritage Preservation Officer, who's Mark Revis in the, Revis in the City of Flagstaff, um, you can invest 30%. You can invest 100% of your property value so long as it's a National Register property and the work at the end allows it to remain eligible. So I wanted to make sure I plug that with realtors because you guys run into these questions all the time from property owners. So we had throughout what we called the summer of Southside, many, many different kinds of public meetings. We did bus tours, we did Lego exercises, we told stories, we went to community events um, and we were so, so, so impressed by the engagement and um, the knowledge that the community could bring to a planning effort like this. Um, but it needed to all get organized and it needed to all be, there were definitely a couple issues that were a little harder to resolve because there wasn't good consensus among residents in the neighborhood. Um, and so we put the Southside Community Association invited a stakeholder group together um, and the city provided a neutral facilitator for that. There were 14 meetings um, and most of these beautiful faces you see around the room, Rick included, um, were present for almost all of them. They talked through a lot of the issues that were most difficult under all the topic areas. Um, and they had the public available to come in and talk to them at any time. So people knew these meetings were happening. They would come in. It was a pretty small crowd throughout the summer. It's hard to get people to come to 14 meetings, um, but we were so grateful for the commitment of all the folks that um, spent their time working through it. And at the end, what we asked is that they endorse um, that we had the right draft plan to put out um, for the 60 day public review that began in December, 2019. So any questions about how, what's a specific plan? How do we get one? I'll go more into the content of it for sure, but I'd be glad if there's any just like process or why fundamental questions that I missed in that pretty quick um, introduction. We don't seem to have any questions, Sarah. Okay, I'm gonna keep rolling. Ah, okay. So here's where we get into the what is the plan anyway part of it. So there's three parts to this specific plan. There is a site and area analysis. That can be, these can all be found on the project website, which I'll make sure I put up a few times throughout the presentation. A site and area analysis is a document that really describes the existing conditions, the history, community knowledge, what we know about the infrastructure. It, it is a really in-depth look at the neighborhood. Realtors, you may find this a very useful document, and it is 120 pages of stories and interests and maps and details. So if you have to dive into the details about the conditions in the neighborhood, the site and the area analysis is, is where you wanna go. Now, volume one of the actual plan is the goals and policies. So when you are looking at a rezoning case, somebody says, I need to rezone this property or I need to um, Get a, get a high occupancy housing conditional use permit, which is another thing coming down the pipeline that we'll look at cross-referencing with the regional plan and with area plans. Um, you will go to this document first. You'll go to volume one and you'll wanna see what are the goals and policies that could apply to the project that we are proposing. Now, volume two is the concept plans. None of volume two is required. We cannot compel any property owner to do anything that's in volume two. Those are great though for conversation starters. That's when you show up and you have a property in one of those areas. That's what the current planners are gonna pull out at a pre-application meeting. That's what we'll wanna show you first because really those illustrations do a couple of things. Um, they test proof of concept. And um, they also were had a ton of considerations that went into them that we document pretty well. Like, why 
Would we want this instead of this? Why is the city's policy that we are trying to achieve this kind of growth pattern? Um, and so I think they're really helpful. Um, but like I said, if you're trying to do property research, start at the site and area analysis. If you're trying to get a handle on how to get a rezoning case together, goals and policies are where you go. And if you just want to see what the community might look like someday, volume two is the place to start. And they're really, they're meant to be used somewhat interchangeably, but if you've never read volume one, some of volume two, you might have to go back and forth. There's also some really key appendices. Um, there's one where we talk about, there's about 117 implementation strategies that are identified as potential opportunities in the South side. Um, about 15 of them are prioritized and they are in one of the appendix and we talk about how we wanna get them done, when we wanna get them done, who's gonna help us work, do the work, who will help us pay for them. Those are really important pieces of, of the plan to consider. It lets you know kind of what's near term and what's further out. Now, another one is this impacts of the Rio de Flag flood control projects. We wrote this plan. So if a Rio de Flag flood control project is completed or not, it could still be applicable. We had to kind of do all this plan writing with both scenarios in mind. Um, so that can be really good. If you wanna know what are the impacts, how could the Rio de Flag change things in the South side, that appendix is the one you wanna to go to. And then we have, not as an appendix, but as available on our website, a very complete review of all the comments we received and how they were addressed. Um, that might not be as much interest to a realtor, but they give a really good sense of maybe the kind of public comments you might get if you're proposing something that has to go through a hearings process in the neighborhood. I think you would hear those comments come up again um, and they could be really useful homework if you're working with um, somebody who has a consultant or a team that has to hold public meetings that include the South Side. Great, great space to start. will help you get an understanding before you hold a meeting that might backfire as some have in the past. So the parts of the plan um, really are surrounding this vision um, that the Southside community shall promote sustainable improvements that enhance and embrace our heritage through cultural stewardship, retaining the unique character and cultural fabric and flavor of our neighborhoods. This is actually something really key when you read about gentrification is one thing that gentrification does is it uniforms um, higher end neighborhoods. And it means that the same retailers, the same, um, the same um, storefront design is happening in Portland and in San Francisco and in Phoenix. The South Side is an incredibly eclectic neighborhood and very unique. And it has some of what the Green Lab from the National Trust for Historic Preservation calls um, incubator business properties. That these smaller historic and older properties are really good at incubating um, small businesses, new businesses, minority owned businesses and women owned businesses. And so when we talk about diversity and access to the market, um, small commercial spaces like you will find throughout the South Side are a really critical piece of what the landscape looks like um, to achieve that. And so that became a really important part of what we talked about with the neighborhood is that they didn't, the neighborhood, people who grew up there didn't want to talk about being a fully residential neighborhood with just retail. They really wanted to talk about how jobs get formed in this neighborhood. And that really um, was an interesting conversation and not one the city had had with a lot of other communities. Usually people want to exclude uses that aren't residential from their residential area. The South Side had a very different approach. They said, it used to be that I could have a blacksmith down the street or somebody welding next door and that was fine. And I'm actually fine with that. And it's okay if we wanna have low impact industrial uses in parts of this neighborhood. So we don't have a zone that does that right now. And learning those things is a really key part of how the vision for the neighborhood came to be. We also have all these other little pieces. We still have flooding, we have public safety. It's a very walkable neighborhood, but there's still transportation issues. All of those things um, are outlined in the plan as to how they, what we're shooting for and also how we think we can get there. So to dive into the details of the plan finally, um, the key, one of the first key pieces is that we identified what we call South Side sub areas. Basically the current zoning in the South Side is that north of Butler until about O'Leary, 
this is all zoned community commercial or community services, which is um, the smaller mix and more neighborhood inclusive mix of commercial. And then commercial services has some light industrial sort of uses like cabinet shops and things like that. South of Butler, it's almost all zoned high density residential and does not allow commercial uses, even though there are still commercial uses in this part of the neighborhood that have been grandfathered in. Um, so we also, of course, have the transect zones in the south side, um, which allow for a form based code to be used. Basically, when we, we started talking about zoning, we said, pretend there's none of that zonings here. What really fits the neighborhood? What really makes sense? Um, and people went through several iterations of these maps with us. What we've laid out here is basically a new land use framework for the south side. And what we've proposed in the plan is that we would rescind all the zoning in the south side and replace it with zoning that better fits the conditions of people's lots so that they can more effectively develop them. And that also will um, provide for a better mix of uses on small lots throughout the neighborhood. So what we're hoping that will do is make the economic value of the small lots sufficient that we can discourage people from, from assembling lots of lots and having whole block redevelopment, which is very impactful to the historic district character and to the character of the community as a whole. So to do that, we had to take a couple steps. First, the regional plan had some language that said, if you're in an urban area, so urban in this map, if you're not familiar with the future growth illustration, there's a lot of information on what you're seeing here right now. Um, this dot and circle is an activity center. You're gonna know that is about the corner of Piccadilly and Regent where the fireplace is next to Grimaldi's. And then this is the pedestrian shed of the activity center. Can people see my, is my cursor moving on the screen? Just want to make sure I'm not drawing something and pointing to things and no one can see it. No, it's not, Sarah. Oh, darn. Let's see. Ooh, maybe I can annotate. All right. I'm going to try something new on the fly. Everyone's excited. I can tell. Okay. Here's the activity center. Can you guys see this now? I don't see it. Oh, you can that little red line she's drawing in the middle there. Okay, so I drew something. You guys can see it now. Good. Um, so, oh, yeah, I okay. So that's um, the core of the activity center. And then this bigger circle, which of course you can't see very well, that is the pedestrian shed. It's about a five or 10 minute walk. Um, that's about how big they are supposed to be. So the colors underneath them are this tan is for urban areas. The hash lines are for future urban areas. The yellow is for suburban and the blue is employment. So the current, and it's not current anymore, the previous version of the regional plant map had this area between Lone Tree and Sawmill as suburban existing and future urban. When in truth, it's existing industrial um, with some urban influences. So we changed the regional plan in two ways. We changed it to make this area current employment and future urban. And then we took some language in the plan and amended it because it used to say that if you were in an urban area type, um, which is that future growth illustration map, um, that you couldn't have industrial uses. Well, that doesn't make sense in the South side. That's not their historic pattern. We have Mayorgas Welding, we have, um, you know, Tag Automotive. There's some great businesses that fit in that urban setting and that want to be able to continue in an urban setting. Um, and so we've changed the regional plan to allow that. So now it says industrial uses are not appropriate in urban areas unless allowed by specific plan. So what this will give us the opportunity to do is when we get to a neighborhood like Sunnyside, which we plan to do a neighborhood plan for in a few years, we'll also be able to have that discussion is, is a mix of industrial, commercial, and residential appropriate and where, um, as opposed to having it blanket uh, pulled out at the regional plan level. So we basically have introduced a lot more flexibility in the land uses 
None of that's in the zoning code yet. We need to do a lot of work in the zoning code to make this possible. But now we at least have the direction that that's somewhere parts of the community want to see um, the land use going. Oh, I think I have to close annotation to keep going. Hang on a second. All right. So um, volume two, oh, did I go too far maybe? So volume two, as I said before of the plan has these illustrations. Um, you'll see if you're looking at this one at the top, that building in the gray is an actual sketch up of the new building at the corner of Benton and South San Francisco Street. Um, the rest of these ones that are colorful are ones we imagined based on the growth pattern we'd want to see in the neighborhood if we can get new zoning adopted. And then these darker brown ones are historic buildings in the South side. This one is um, his, in the historic register, it's called the Ciudad de Mexico um, grocery store. Um, but I think it's been headspace most recently. So we, we've done these sort of multiple looks at infill and redevelopment scenarios so that that's something you can start talking about with clients and that you can ask us questions about why is this this way? What if I wanted to do this? It's just a good point at which to start conversations um, for these unique neighborhoods. Now on that map where you saw the blue area, which is the live make center sub area of the south side, the emphasis in that area is largely to have larger mixed use buildings and allow for craft manufacturing and other low impact industrial uses throughout that area. So we've done some drawings to show how we think that works. We've also showed illustrations from other places that have effectively implemented this kind of district. Sometimes it gets called a warehouse district. Sometimes it gets called, you know, the something, you know, really hip like a manufacturing zone. Um, but the whole point is that it brings together art and creation in a really unique way um, without being solely marketed to artists. Um, the South Side Main Streets is really the Mike's Pike, Phoenix, Beaver, and San Francisco. Um, the goal for these areas is to preserve and adaptively reuse the commercial fabric. We talked about why that is so important. Um, and also to make sure that the new infill in that area is compatible in architecture and polishes and improves the urban fabric um, while adding to that mix of uses. I think we have some examples where um, that's being done very well. So far, the community response to the building at, Bun at Benton and San Francisco has been very positive. Community response to the retail space around the hub has not been positive yet, but it also hasn't been occupied yet, um, which is of course another challenge we're talking about at a citywide level. Live Work Neighborhood is the third area. On that previous map, it was orange. Um, and it talks a lot about preserving single family homes um, in, in this part of the community. There are over 200 historic single family cottages. And there are in fact, probably more. We are working right now on that. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more of that later. Um, but the idea is that these, these mixed uses, the multifamily, can also include some small lots and some commercial spaces. Um, the O'Leary Street Market falls into the live work neighborhood, um, as does I think the current location of Val's, um, which is a little barbershop on South San Francisco Street. Um, but we, in this case, we would like to keep the smaller lots. Um, that would be the objective of the plan. And we'd need to figure out how all the policies work in order to execute that. Um, but we'd want to see more allow for more commercial uses than some of these areas currently allow. And then the neighborhood core is an area where we have many high quality historic single family homes and duplexes. Um, and really preserving this area is the key to keeping the South Side the kind of neighborhood where a family might want to live someday in the future. Um, the, the truth is, is that there's very few families with children that live in the South Side now compared to 50 or 60 years ago. A neighborhood that loses places and homes like this loses the opportunity to be a family neighborhood for many years. Um, and that really is a, is a force of gentrification that we had a lot of conversations about um, with the community members and with city staff as we were working on their neighborhood plan. 
So heritage preservation has been mentioned repeatedly. We have our National Register District for the Flagstaff South Site here. Um, but the community did not necessarily want a restrictive historic overlay for the neighborhood. That's not what we heard. What we heard is there's so many different pockets of historic buildings that relate to each other, but maybe four blocks later, it's a really different character um, that they wanted us to make smaller districts and work more closely with property owners to do that. Um, and that is part of what the historic preservation officer will be doing for the next few years is talking to people in these areas and getting them organized to have discussions about what an overlay that protects their investment in their historic single family home looks like. Um, we also would like to create more awareness of the human stories that are really the foundation of the South Side. The South Side Community Association is going to be working on a stories project that's about recording the history of families and individuals that live in the neighborhood and making that not only something that's available you know, in an oral history format or a written format, but actually bringing that out into the neighborhood and getting some excitement about the neighborhood's history and culture, um, which, you know, many people felt was often overlooked um, when we talk about the Riordans and the Babbitts. There's really just as much interesting history in the South Side that could be shared. Um, another piece of that too is doing a new context, um, you know, Historic preservation moves on. The National Historic Preservation Act says that a building that could be eligible is 50 years older or older. Um, the South Side was the center of the civil rights movement in Flagstaff and none of, and right now, you know, 50 years ago is 1970. So much of the civil rights era is possibly eligible for historic preservation grants. The Park Service has an exciting grant that's specifically on African-American civil rights history that may apply to several buildings in the South Side. And we are extremely excited to start working on that and expanding what the district looks like and including that civil rights history. You know, the Ebony Flames, um, the sit-ins at El Charo, um, so many of those pieces of, of what um, was part of the civil rights movement in Flagstaff um, could be lost if we're not keeping the stories and telling them in exciting ways so people remember what's special about these places. So that's really good stuff. I'm really excited that we're working on it. Um, and uh, it'll be part of how we address historic preservation in the South Side moving forward. So you can see a lot of these buildings in the South Side, they aren't pristine historic buildings. And I don't think the expectation is that they ever would be. But what is happening in some places is that there's building styles and also historic buildings that have maybe been unoccupied for a few years that are, we're having a hard time getting refurbished or we're having a hard time recreating that environment. So there's still some work on the zoning code side um, to help get more of that um, footprint and site layout that's really unique to the South Side recognized and replicatable so we can keep the character of this neighborhood as exciting and interesting as it is today. Flooding in the South Side. I think the number one goal for the South Side community and the stakeholder group really um, pointed this out to us is to resolve these longstanding flooding hazards. It's been a hundred years. And since the 1980s, the restrictions on sub substantial improvements to properties and the flood insurance requirements have been a burden to many homeowners in this area. And so, you know, removal of the FEMA floodplain requires the completion of the Army Corps of Engineers project. Um, but then there are still going to be localized areas um, such as the, we call it sometimes Lake DuPont. It's the corner of DuPont and LaRue. Um, it floods very regularly and it's not because of the bigger Rio entirely. It's also because of the geography of that area. And so the idea is we need to do some, also continue to work on localized flooding issues. Um, it's been the longest flooded neighborhood in the community and it's really time to make sure we're addressing those concerns. So the stormwater group of course has a huge job and a lot of work cut out for them. And the, there's a project that's gonna be a very large one consuming them for the next um, few years. So there's a lot of work to be done on this. I think it's a very long-term goal of not only having five-year objectives, but also maybe 20-year objectives for the South Side. But the important thing is that we keep, keep moving in this direction so that the neighborhood can um, recover from um, the damage 
of uh, property from flooding and some of these have repeatedly flooded areas. We also looked at the south side. One of its greatest opportunities is if you go to walk score, you will see that this is listed as the most walkable neighborhood Flagstaff. It's not downtown, it's south side. Um, and that's for a whole host of reasons. Um, but there's many ways in which walkability in the neighborhood can be improved. There's not a lot of like new transportation routes or road building that we're gonna do through this neighborhood besides the Lone Tree Overpass. Um, but the idea of having bike boulevards that parallel Butler Avenue is one that came from the community, not from city staff, even though Martin Ince is fantastic. We have a great multimodal planner. Um, the a concept of how bikes should be moving efficiently through the neighborhood and safely is one that came from the neighbors. Um, they said, I'd love to see bikes on this street. I think it's a better route. I see people do it informally all the time. Why don't we make it better for them? Um, also, the idea of finding ways to have uh, parking management work better in the south side. Um, there is a need, especially near NAU, to do some different kinds of management that I think Park Flag will be working on after we get some revenue back into that program. Um, and then there's also, of course, the redesign of the Downtown Connection Center, which um, Mountain Line is working on right now. Um, and there's pieces that'll come in as we work on the Milton and 180 projects with Arizona Department of Transportation. So I think overall, this has taken a lot of those pieces and figured out how to make them work really well together for the benefit of the whole community and for the benefit of the neighborhood. So here's, a, here's an example of where the flooding and the transportation issues kind of come together. These areas with the red on them are areas that are missing sidewalks in the south side. And there's even some areas in pretty walkable places. Um, you know, missing sidewalks in a downtown are really um, something that the city knows we need to work on addressing. The key question is how do you fund it? Um, for La Plaza Vieja and Sunnyside, um, we've done bonds before. That may be something we discuss again in the future. Is, is there a bond that we can do to complete sidewalks in some neighborhoods? Um, it was not included in the street repair and, and uh, street safety bond that was done, or tax that was done a few years ago. So that's something that we have identified, but we don't have a funding source outlined for it yet. We also talked in many ways about how the South Side used to be a neighborhood with schools and parks, and now it has neither. So the Murdoch Center, of course, is a community center that is open to the public and everyone, um, but it's part of our clearly defined need that there should be park space, there should be green places in the South Side. Um, we actually weren't gonna talk about the Murdoch Center in the plan at first, but we were to say, well, we're gonna let the Southside Community Board do the visioning for it. But ultimately so many great ideas were coming forward from public engagement. We did do some design work, um, at least concept plan level design work to talk about how the building could be expanded and how the grounds could be changed to make it a better service to the whole community. We also, another idea that came from the neighborhood that was not top of my list as a planner um, was the idea of taking the opportunity of the Lone Tree Overpass and looking at creating park space underneath it. Now we don't quite know how that will work out, but I think it's a really exciting idea to have an urban park and a new urban park for this neighborhood um, that could be really exciting. Now it's all gonna depend on how much space is really available as the bridge is being constructed. But the good news is that as we're getting to those initial designs, you know, maybe getting to our first set of 30% plans for the overpass, this idea of a park and how it can be incorporated is already there. And we're gonna have the chance to think about the park and the bridge together from the very beginning. Capital Improvements is very excited to have an opportunity to, to have that kind of a benefit come from a project that already has a, a good traffic a tra or a transportation benefit for the community. We've also looked at a few small spaces where parks might be possible. Um, this is the corner, this is our Lady of Guadalupe right here at the bottom. Maybe I'll have to annotate that. Um, so here is our Lady of Guadalupe right here. This is Kendrick and Benton and Mike's Pike. And currently there's just a very tiny triangle about this big with a tree in it. It's a lot of pavement. 
um, that's really not needed to serve the transportation system here. So the buses do move through this area. So we worked with Mountain Line to think about how much of this space could be freed up to provide a green space or maybe some parking. Um, and we found out we could do this with no net loss of parking and it could provide um, several hundred square feet of green space in a heavily foot trafficked area. Um, you know, maybe a place where people could spill out of the church um, after an event and go sit in the park and talk together. I think as we're living a life uh, post COVID, having the kinds of spaces where people can have impromptu gatherings in their neighborhood and still be socially distanced um, and be comfortable is going to be really important. Um, and so that idea is already kind of planted. This is actually the only park space project we have that currently has some funding for it. Oh, I think I have to clear everything again. Sarah, we do have a question, if you have time. So the first one is from Mark Coletti. What is the status of the Lone Tree Overpass? Sure. So the Lone Tree Overpass is expected to be constructed within uh, seven to five years. So they are currently completing um, uh, the requests for proposals. I think we've done a request for proposals. Maybe it's coming soon. Um, for somebody to do a design and build. Um, that design and build includes the idea of how we could incorporate park space. The park space itself isn't funded, but the transportation improvement is. That's, I'm not sure in any way, shape, or form about that, so congratulations. The 60% of you who did actually- Are there any other questions, Judy? Let me look here, let's see. Um, nope, that was it, thank you. Yeah. And I think too, to know that for the Lone Tree Overpass, all the businesses and property owners in there have been well notified about the, um, the potential of when this would be coming and the city has done, are, is moving towards its first acquisition um, for the pro project this year. But there will be property acquisition. That's part of what gives us the opportunity to look at park space as an opportunity. There will also be property acquisition for the Rio de Flag Flood Control Project, but that doesn't really affect the south side so much as some areas north of, of 66. Another place we have that city property that's sort of uh, underutilized or utilized poorly, I think people use it, but not maybe in a way that's very well organized or neighborly, um, is there's a little strip of uh, the Rio de Flag between O'Leary Street and Lone Tree um, that currently has a lot of trespass issues. Um, people have sort of turned it into parts of their backyards, even though much of that land is owned by the city. Um, so we've done some additional door-to-door -door engagement with those property owners. And I don't know that we have 100% concurrence on this idea, but I, we really do see that there's an opportunity that the Foots Trail on Lone Tree could come through this green space connect to O'Leary and then O'Leary and Butler would have a signalized pedestrian crossing, which would give you a way to get downtown without coming all the way into San Francisco if you're coming from the Lone Tree Corridor and you're going by bicycles or pedestrian uh, methods. So this is just an idea. It needs a lot more engagement, but we've done some initial sketches. We kept these really sketchy because we didn't want people to think we had designed the whole thing. Um, but it does pass really close to people's houses. So we have to be very, very sensitive of how we would implement this um, so that everybody's uh, concerns are really heard, especially those who live closest to the path. And I think that's everything I have on a slide, but I'm more than happy to pull up the website, go through the plan, answer some questions. Right. Those we don't seem to have any questions in there. Does anyone want to unmute themselves and ask a, um, Sarah a question? Folks, we're going to take uh, congratulations to the winners. Todd, good job. Thanks, Adam. And uh, Marguerite will be sending your prize. Hmm. Online <laughs> I wish I was getting a prize. There's no prizes, Judy. <laughs> no prizes today, Sarah. <laughs> Let's see. No, no questions. Would you like me to show you, you all the website real quick for the South Side plan so you can find the materials I talked about a little better? Yes, please. Okay, great. 
So to find the South Side Plan, you go to flagstaff.az.gov forward slash South Side Plan, and it's going to take you to this web page, which is actually an interactive web map, not just a, a, not just a web page. So if you pull it up on your phone, you will probably only get the image and then there'll be a little I button and the I button you click and then you get this whole side panel. It looks really different on a mobile phone. So I always like to explain that to people. Um, but you'll see right here that volume one and volume two are embedded right here in the text. Um, you also can find out um, more about our public participation planning and how all of that went. Um, the other documentation that you can find here is that there are previous meetings. So you can even find some explanations. Um, I always really like going to the planning and zoning commission he uh, hearings and work sessions. Those are usually the most detailed ones we do for a specific plan. Um, so you can go through and find any of those videos. Um, we also have some information about what changed between draft and final. Um, how we responded to comments, what comments weren't incorporated. And then you have here several maps um, that'll help you look at it more closely. So this is the sub areas, but you can using this map zoom in on a particular property that you're working on and see which sub area it is. Does it have any historic resources on it? Um, we also have a characteristics map and that map does show um, it takes a little longer to load. It's a little more detailed, but it does have the floodplain, which buildings are currently considered part of the National Register inventory. And of course it won't load for me right now. My computer is making the fan noise like it's tired of me talking. <laughs> um, we also have the current zoning map for the neighborhood, um, which you can look at here as well. Um, and then, like I said, there's even more public participation information where you can walk through all our past public meetings, get a sense of what the process looked like, learn about the environmental justice grant that the Friends of the Rio completed, see past presentations. Um, you can also see the survey results of all the surveys that we did throughout the period of this, working on the Southside plan. So that's all available on our website. And if you ever lose the link, you can always email me. I try and keep the short URLs really available, um, but I'd be glad to help if you're looking for something in particular. Oh, and the site and area analysis is right here as well on the homepage. So we do have a question from Rick. Um, can you address how a property can be developed? For example, the property on Butler, just east of San Francisco, what the challenges are and what the opportunities might be. So let me see if I know what we're talking about, Rick. Are we, so the San Francisco and Butler, are we thinking about this property right here? Can Rick ask a question? I think so. So, so one of the things that um, I saw somebody also asked if I would type the website in the chat box. So let me do that real quick before I answer the question. Um, the many of the properties in the south side have a maximum 60 foot uh, zoning uh, height in the zoning code. Oh, I know where you're talking about, Rick. Rick is talking about this property right here. So this property right here is a historic set of cottages um, that were all put together um, as part of a set of employee housing for a Basque sheep, sheep herding operation. They've fallen into a bit of disrepair. All seven of the buildings are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And I believe if I pull up the characteristics map, we're also going to see that it's in the floodplain. Um, let's see if I can pull that up. Is it going to let me zoom in today? So I don't know if that makes sense to everybody. This is, so this is the Murdoch Center and there's a little alley over here and these little greenhouses right there. So, um, and I'll see if I can pull up. This is a good real time example. Um, but you can see it's in the, so it's in the floodplain. So there, here's the choices those property owners have. Um, you can uh, restore all of those buildings 
to their historic condition. And that includes um, some really interesting things that if you're really nerdy and you want to dive down the historic preservation floodplain wormhole for a while, um, there's actually new exciting guidelines on how to develop um, and redevelop uh, historic properties in the floodplain that allow you to do things like pick up a historic building and drop it on a footing that's outside the floodplain. That's really helpful if you're doing a commercial remodel um, and wanting to use this for like a little boutique hotel or something like that. Um, but you can do that and you don't have a substantial improvement maximum. You still have to show all your receipts um, to the stormwater manager because they, you have to basically have like some auditable paperwork for FEMA. Um, but there's no cap on the amount you can spend on improving them as long as it meets the national register criteria. Um, your second option is you can pay to have a complete phase two cultural resource study prepared for the buildings. And that would mean each and every building, including their floor plan and layout is documented by a historic preservation professional. The city has a list of 22 historic preservation professionals that have registered with us. So if you ever have a client who's told you need a cultural resource study, you should call Mark Revis and he can send you a list of people who've said they're qualified and are willing to do the work. Um, we never make a recommendation off that list, but we've seen their culture, we've seen their CVs and we know that they fit some of the park service criteria um, for whichever things they're qualified to do. Um, so you can have somebody prepare that study. You can then demo them and then build something new outside the floodplain. The problem is with our current zoning, you will never get seven units back on that property without building something really, really awkward. It has very limited vehicular access. Um, there, It's a smaller lot. So maybe you'll get six units and a retail on the first floor. It's not going to be much more productive than it currently is laid out. Um, in fact, many of the lots in the south side where you see a maximum building height of 60 feet would if they include all the other site development standards, would not be able to build a 60 foot building on them without combining them with other lots. Um, the Benton and South San Francisco building, which doesn't show on the map because it's new, but is right here, is a great example of that. That top and the, the top of that building is right at 45 feet. So, um, but there is a lot of, of very difficult pieces of how this should work, how this works when you've got floodplain and historic preservation involved. Um, my advice is when that's happening is to get the stormwater staff and historic preservation staff working with you early so you can understand what your options are. Did that ask, answer Rick's question? He's gonna give me a thumbs up in the chat, I bet. Rick, did that answer your question? Oh, okay. Good. Other questions? There's a question from Judy Louts, and I don't know if you already talked about this. It says, when a property is determined to have fixed store value and they want to sell, there are costs involved with the development that impacts the sale. Was this taken into consideration? Yes. I uh, the, the city of Flagstaff um, does, isn't the one that decides something is historic or not. The rules of the Park Service and the Arizona Sites Committee and our agreement with the State Historic Preservation Office does. What the zoning code in Flagstaff says is that if you are outside of an historic overlay and you want to do something to a historic property that um, is not a restoration project or a rehabilitation project, which those meet certain criteria with the Park Service, um, that you have to prepare a cultural resource study or you have to have had prepared. We have had some people who tried to write their own historic cultural resource studies, and they were interesting. They didn't meet the standards in the zoning code. You still have to have someone hired who does it for you um, because you need to meet these standards of being a professional anthropologist or a professional historic architect. So there's additional consulting costs if when you buy a historic property, your objective is to do something other than restore, retain, or rehabilitate the historic property. Um, we're always glad to answer questions about that. We can't give anyone prices. I can tell you there's three levels of resource studies that we could require. Um, the smallest one is a letter report. And the last time I asked a consultant how much he was charging people for it, 
He gave me a ballpark figure between five and $10,000 for one report. So if you're a small scale developer, um, that can be very impactful. Um, if you are, that doesn't mean you can't make any changes to historic properties. It's just that you have to work closely with the heritage preservation officer so that you are avoiding unexpected costs later down the road. So we have another question for Michael Dugan, and this will be our last question because we have another webinar, sorry. Is the city going to address the student parking issues? I talked to many residents claim there is no room to place trash and recycling containers due to over parking. We've done some different management pilots of that um, throughout the time we were working on the Southside plan. Um, I think if we had the meters on and Park Flag had revenues coming in, we could be using some of those funds to do some of that work. Right now with the meters off, we can really only pay for the enforcement. Um, it limits our funding. And so it may take a few years to get back to addressing that fully, um, but I do hope that we can. We definitely have some ideas about how that could be improved um, and what we could do. Um, there are some details of that in the plan and if anybody wants to follow up with me on it, just to let you guys move on to your other webinar, I'd be glad to, to let anyone who needs to get in touch with me. Okay, Judy Louch does have a follow-up question. Is that, um, are there grants available for that? Most people in the South Side do not have that type of money. We have grants. Um, we have a Historic Facades and Science Grant, which is a $10,000 matching grant. Any property owner that owns a historic property that wants to make improvements to it that fit within the National Register um, guidelines can apply. And we have actually this year, in past years, we only had 10 grants. This year, we have 15 grants to give out. Um, even with the recovery, um, we can do that. Uh, I saw her follow up. No, we do not provide any grants for the resource studies. Um, it's a good question, should we? Uh, but we've not, I don't have a funding source for that right now. Beautification is the funding source um, for the historic facade and science grant. I don't think they could cover research. So it's just a cost of development um, in the zoning code that has to be considered. Okay, well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. It's lovely to talk with you all. Please feel free to get in touch if you have any questions.